This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening. My name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. I would like to acknowledge that the University of South Australia meets on the land of the Kaurna people. We wish to express our respect for the Kaurna people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Kaurna people have with their traditional land. I extend that respect to Aboriginal peoples from other areas of South Australia and Australia. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to our In Conversation and book launch with one of Australia's most respected social psychologists, Hugh McKay AO. Tonight, Hugh will be in conversation with the Reverend Honourable Dr Lynn Arnold AO as they discuss Hugh's recently published books, The Inner Self and The Question of Love. I'm thrilled that Hugh is joining us for the first time at the Hawke Centre and I thank him for his time and his extraordinary insight and commitment to social research and to also welcome back Lynn Arnold. This event is being recorded and a video will be available on the Hawke Centre website. We encourage you to bring this to the attention of your friends and colleagues who could not join us tonight online. I'm sure you will find this a truly inspiring conversation and it is now my pleasure to welcome Hugh McKay and Dr Lynn Arnold. Thank you. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here with you all and especially with uh, Hugh McKay. Welcome Hugh, good to see you. Thank you very much Lynn, it's lovely to be here and lovely to see you again. I remember we had a, a fascinating conversation when your book Beyond Belief was launched. And I'm looking forward to uh, tonight to talking about these latest two books uh, of yours, uh, The Inner Self and uh, The Question of Love. Um, now, it, just before I, I start, the, the question of love has on its back uh, this phrase about Richard and Freya. They should be happier than they are. And The Inner Self is a book that then goes on to, as you say about this book, um, the purpose of this book is to encourage us to face the truth about who we really are, to become aware of our tendency to hide from that truth, to appreciate what it is we're really hiding from and why we might want to hide from it. Now, Hugh, it's interesting that these two books of yours are coming out at the same time. They're, they're seemingly quite different. One's fiction, one's not fiction. Um, one's uh, very much a uh, focus on a, on a couple. The other one is a more helicopter view, albeit with individual stories in it. Um, you know, I, my first thought was, is this a kind of uh, no play where you have the uh, Kyojin uh, light-hearted bit in the middle? Or um, <laughs> Then I was more struck by the fact, maybe of the book of Exodus, where every alternate chapter moves from the helicopter view to the local specific view. Mm -hmm. So I think there is actually a, a, a complementarity between them. What was your thought in, uh, thinking in, in, in writing these two mm -hmm. and having them come out together? Mm -hmm. Well, having them come out literally on the same day uh, was the bright idea, the brave idea of the publisher. Um, but in fact, they weren't written together. I wrote The Question of Love, the novel, uh, about, I first wrote it, about drafted it about four years ago. Uh, and because it's a rather unusual structure, I've, I've tried to take the musical theme and variations <laughs> Very for, interesting. and translate that to the written word. So it, it was quite an intricate writing process and it took a long time to get it right. By the time I'd got it right, about three years after I started, I was beginning work on the inner self and I hadn't, it, this will seem absurd, but I hadn't actually connected the two books in my own mind. But the publisher, looking at the outlined in a self as I was proposing it said well actually the, the themes are very similar there's a lot of there's a lot of synergy between the th themes that you're going to write about in inner self and uh, the central theme of the novel which is this couple who 
uh, struggling along, doing reasonably well, but hiding from each other and from themselves a great deal. So why don't we think of the novel as a kind of case study uh, of the themes in the inner self, and we'll publish them as companion volumes. So that's how it happened. Mm. Uh, and I thought that was, first I thought the publisher was crazy, and then I thought, actually, this is, this is quite smart. Mm. So the question I, think, I think your publisher was right. I, I, I must say I read uh, a question, the question of love first, yes. and then the inner self. Um, if I'd had the time over again, and, and those who are listening in, when you go to buy the books, I, I might even suggest that you read them in parallel. Uh, that uh, you have one as your maybe uh, early evening reading, and one as your later evening reading, when you might be reading in bed or whatever, yes. um, to follow them through, because I, I think there, there is a weaving together that works very well. Mm, mm, and the, the the idea of the musical variations that you play with in the question of love, um, I, I I learned a lot about the whole idea of musical variations from the way you approach that. Oh, good, good. Mm. Um, okay, well now let's let's get right into uh, uh, particularly the uh, the inner self, the joy of discovering who we really are. Um, you, you talk about the the inner and the outer life. I was particularly struck with your reference to the, the, the difference between essentialism and existentialism. Could you talk about that a bit? Mm. Yes, I think we, well, the, the existentialists, of course, were riding high during the 20th century, especially the, the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and their view of, of humankind is that there is no essence, that there is only behavior and history. In other words, if you want to understand someone, just look at what they do and what they have done, and that's all you need to know about them. And that led to the whole behaviorist school of psychology as well, B.F. Mm -hmm. Skinner, a name Skinner. Uh, that many of our audience will be familiar with, who dismissed the whole idea of a mental life as just fictional and irrelevant. We don't need to know anything about what's going on inside. We just observe the behavior and that that's the clue. Uh, that's all we need to know. Whereas the essentialists, going back to Plato and beyond, said, no, no, there is such a thing as human nature. There is an essence of humanity. And we are at our richest. We are at our fullest. Uh, we have access to life's deepest satisfactions when we are in tune with our deep inner self. Now, another way of thinking about that, I think, Lynn, is to say that a, a, a very popular word at the moment is the word identity. We have an identity. Now, that's an interesting word because identity is all about how we identify ourselves. It's like the outer shell, socially determined. You can't gaze at your navel and discover your identity. If you want to discover your identity, you look at into the faces of the people who love you or will put up with you or the people you work with or your neighbours and so uh, And you look at your roles, you know, you're a father or perhaps a partner well, or a in son. Fact, in, in fact, on, on uh, page five of your book, you actually put it this way. Do I have a different, deeper, more enduring sense of my true self than the versions of myself I present to the world in my various roles? Mm. And then you talk about partner, friend, colleague, son, daughter, brother, sister. Mm. Um, does it make sense to think of there being a real me that is performing those various roles but is not fully expressed in any of them? Mm. Yes, and that goes right to the heart of the book. Uh, and I open, in fact, with a little story about the British actress... Um, Emma Thompson. Actor, actor, sorry, not actress. British actor, Emma Thompson, uh, who on the eve of her 60th birthday uh, said that she had decided to face that question, who am I really, and, and take away all the masks and the labels that she wore, actor, mother, wife, etc., uh, and say, who am I really, which she said, and I think this is probably, pro many of our audience can probably relate to this, she had always thought was a rather boring question, but now, on the eve of her 60th birthday, for many people it's the eve of their 40th birthday, the classic midlife crisis, uh, she decided it was actually a riveting question. And I think it's a riveting question. Mm -hmm. So let's explore, to come back to the way you, you phrased it. Yes, there is the outer shell, but when we, and that's all about how we're different from each other. Lynn 
is that kind of person, Hugh is that kind of person, and we can look at all the ways in which they're different. And that's fascinating. We're obsessed with the differences between us and with mm -hmm. identities. The whole movement towards identity politics is an expression. Yes, I, want, I, want, I do want to come back to that a bit yes, later. We'll come back to that. So if we say, well, now let's, let's not think about identity. Let's think about self. What if, if you go right inside the self, uh, which sounds as though it's going to be an even deeper exploration of how you're unique, what you'll actually find is that you are indivisibly part of humanity, that the, the inner self is where we come to terms with our common humanity and uh, what it means to belong to a species like the human species is a social species yeah. can only yeah. survive let alone thrive in groups and communities and families and neighborhoods you, you, uh, talk about, you talk about that as being a paradox and and, and it's quite an interesting way in which you, you present that but before into the community side i still want to stay with this essentialism mm. uh, versus exist existentialism idea I, I know i was struck by the uh, the spanish have two verbs to be uh, ser uh, and estar uh, say coming from the Latin essere and the star from the estere, which is to the very essence of being in 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 ser, uh, whereas the action related, place related sense of a star. Um, you make the comment that uh, we are more than the mere sum of our actions, so you're actually trying to find something beyond uh, this just ad addition of all the different things we do, the different relationships that we might have. Mm. Um, and you, you have this idea of the outer shell. Um, is it possible, in your view, that we're ever actually able to get deep down into that in, inner kernel of the shell? Mm. Yes, I, I believe it is possible. And I think the whole mindfulness movement, the meditation movement, uh, the, the ancient mystical traditions, uh, philosophical traditions, and contemporary uh, psychology all say yes it is possible to go deep within ourselves and what will we find now of course we'll find a lot of a lot of detritus a lot of stuff we didn't want to find but right at the core what we'll find is that we have that the thing that actually defines us as human mm -hmm. is our capacity for love yeah, uh, or compassion. I want to come back to that, but can I just say that um, I, I, I have always strongly believed in silence, uh, meditation, going into the that deep space. Mm. Um, I actually wonder if it's possible to to get to the very kernel. Is there a self that is is perhaps undiscoverable? I, I'm mindful of um, that uh, 18th century futurist Louis Mercier, who wrote what is arguably the first time travel novel in 1798, uh, the year 2500, he called it. And he spoke about two infinities. He said, uh, first of all, you look through a telescope into infinity and you, you see something which can never be reached. And then you look into a microscope and you, and that was as far as their technologies went in those days, into the microscope. And then you go further and further down, but there's another infinity there that you'll never quite reach. Um, so I, I really wonder if it's possible to actually get to that central kernel of self. Yes. Well, um, various other people who've read the book uh, have raised that question with me. And I'm, I'm I mean, I'm, perhaps I'm a simple fellow. Uh, I think it is possible to get there because I think once we've understood the essence of what it means to be human, that's all we really need to know. No. Now, you could say... But beyond that, there is some deeper essence, there is some kernel of self that we can't access at all. Uh, in some religious traditions, people would say known only to God. Yeah, well, uh, I, mean, I, guess, I guess that's where I come from, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, uh, that's, that's fine. In, in terms of our day-to-day -day life, mm. uh, operationally, Practically, yeah, yeah. it seems to me we can get deep enough to understand the one thing we really need to understand, 
mm. about humans. I mean, it's a bit like, I, I wasn't aware of the book that you just referred to, Lynn, but it's a bit like uh, what we hear from Brian Cox and others about mm, the cosmos yeah. and what's mm. going on and black holes and deep space and dark matter and all that. I mean, it's all really fascinating, uh, but actually in terms of whether my neighbor needs me to drop in and spend 10 minutes chatting to her because yeah. she's frail and elderly, it, it has very little, diff very little impact. Whereas a sense of my deep inner self does yes. have an impact on my day-to-day yeah. -day life. That's if there's right. something right. beyond that, I suspect it won't be connected to the business of humans interacting with humans. Well, let's look at that. The business of humans acting, interacting with uh, other humans. Uh, you do talk about the idea of uh, common humanity. Uh, and so this relationship of self and community, um, you know, we, we, we recall Maggie Thatcher sort of denying yes. that there's any concept of society. It was only individuals. And uh, yes. you have such writers as Ayn Rand, uh, uh, who was hyper-individualist. Uh, you know, yes. her, her, her book, Anthem, is... Uh, is a proclamation of the celebration of individualism versus any sense of community or collective. Uh, yet Jenny Zamyatin's we is, is a bit similar. Um, but I'm of your school of thought, I, and I think there is this concept. Um, but how do you do this, this, this line between, is it possible to define a line of some degree of specialness of the individual within the context of specialness of community? Yes. Yes, it's a good way of putting it, Lynn, and, and I think we can, and that brings us back to the idea of identity. What's, what's special about us is the ways in which we are different from other people. Uh, gender, um, appearance, job, relationships, all of those things are uniquely you or uniquely me, and that's where we get our sense of independence of being unique individuals. And of course, it's true that we are. Mm -hmm. But this is precisely why I think the, the inner journey is so important to get beneath what is most interesting to what, what is most significant, which is that if the human species is to survive and perhaps even thrive, it will require us to understand that we are social beings as well as being unique individuals, that as unique individuals, we can only thrive and prosper in relationship with partners, children, parents, siblings, neighbors, colleagues, uh, fellow choristers, uh, fellow members of a football team or a drinking group or, or whatever it is. I mean, we are by nature, we congregate. That's, mm -hmm. that's what humans do. Now, once you understand that we are absolutely not just independent with a unique sense of our own identity but also as the pandemic has reminded us mm -hmm. interdependent we are indivisibly a species once you understand that then it seems to me it's a very short step to accepting that the only appropriate way the only sensible response to that is to say well we better treat each other kindly and respectfully and with compassion Mm -hmm. Now, regardless, and this is the acid test, of course, of whether we've got to be in ourself, regardless of our emotional response to each other. I don't believe compassion in the sense of the species maintaining mm -hmm. compassion, the thing that lies at the essence of the self, has got anything to do with affection or whether we happen to like other people. It's to do with an acknowledgement that our common humanity imposes an obligation on us Mm. Treat everybody. On, on this issue, uh, uh, we will come back to talk about love a bit more later, but I think it's, this is the time to, to pick up a point that you make in, in your book. Uh, we think of love as an emotion, but in the case of compassionate love, it's more accurate to think of it as a discipline, a commitment to a particular way of life in which patience, kindness, tolerance, and respect become our characteristic responses to everyone we encounter. You know, I, I, I can't remember the exact Greek word from which we get compassionate, but it, it, its etymology is that it means a, 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 a gripping of the stomach uh, where we are, we, are, we are really gripped by something we see and, and, and uh, it, 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 it hurts us, the gripping of it. Mm. So it, it is something deliberately connected to the, the well-being of others. Yes. 
Yes, I, I may not get this quote completely uh, clear, but Samuel Johnson wrote something like, um, we are capable of kindness even when there is no fondness. Yes. And I think that's you, a, you, you, a, you do quote that in the book. Yeah, it's I a very nice, uh, yes. You, you uh, wasn't uh, referring to Scots, but the... Uh... Yes, I, I think people have initially have a little bit of trouble with uh, this idea. Is that we think of compassion as as a sort of groaning of the spirit, as though uh, someone has moved us because of their need. Whereas I think it's much more helpful and much truer to our obligations as members of the human species to say, no, actually, this is just a way of being in the world. This is the breakthrough moment when we understand mm -hmm. that at our core, we are loving beings. That, that, that's what social, social beings are. Uh, and to the extent to which we hide from that or deny it or try to minimize it will be the extent to which we diminish ourselves as humans. But if we simply embrace this, as you say, as a discipline, yeah. not as an emotion, and say, well, the only sensible way, I, I, I don't like this person, I could never agree with her politics, but we're on the planet together. Mm -hmm. I can disagree respectfully. I can disagree kindly and I can respond to someone's need even if there's nothing about them I like. So is it something like the sort of synapse connection between that which is ourself uh, and that which is the community in which we are? Like our brain has these synapses join different things together. This yes. is how we join together with others. Yes, absolutely. That's a, that's a, a perfect metaphor, I think, for what I'm, what I'm trying to say, that, that as unique individuals, we are inevitably, irrevocably connected to all the other unique individuals in this in this whole this thing mm. this 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 thing that Margaret Thatcher and others deny uh, <laughs> that is society in this case or humanity uh, is the big picture word for mm. it. Now you, you you've mentioned uh, meditation, how we can go in to try and find our inner self, and I know in Beyond Belief you, you make a lot out of this this point, the ways in which we can go looking into our inner self. Mm. You talk about this paradox that finding the inner self is actually finding ourselves in. Uh, in social relationship with others. It reminds me of, of a study that was done of uh, uh, some Catholic nuns and some Buddhists when they were going into meditation and they put, uh, they measured their brain activity. And what they found is, is in the first stage, there was a settling of it, the, 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 the neurons settled down uh, in the brain. But as they went deeper and deeper, that part of the brain which we identify with being self-identification the, the I-ness of ourselves mm. virtually stopped. Um, and it was the rest of the brain that now became the most important. In other yes. words, we had touched the collective just by being in that state of meditation. Yes, yes, yes. I've read that research uh, and I'm very convinced by it. And it makes, it, it meshes very precisely with the sort of philosophical framework that we're using for this conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. And it does seem paradoxical that when we go deeply into ourselves, what we what we discover is our connectedness. Uh, when we're on the surface, we're much more concerned with our differences, with our individuality. Uh, and so it's, a, so it's a good question as to why meditation is good for us and, and is good in general. And of course, the answer is captured in what you've just described. It's good for us because it's beneficial to the community. It's mm. good for us because it, 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 it replenishes our resources for dealing with and, and reminding us that our responsibility as citizens, as neighbors, family members, just as humans, is to engage with the communities around us, uh, contribute to them, to be truly a social being. Now, Let's go on to this, the dealing with community, the, the dealing with, with others in community. You, you make a very, very strong point. In fact, it's foundational, in, uh, certainly in the inner self, but I, I'd argue it's, it's foundational too in the question of love, because the relationship of um, uh, uh, Richard and Freya, they should be happier than they are. In the end, you're coming down to the role of truth. Uh, how, do, how do you see truth? Mm. Well, in the context of this discussion, I suppose I'd prefer to use the word authenticity or 
being true to ourselves, by which, I mean, this above all, to thine own self be true, yes, yes, famous, quote, famous Shakespearean quote. Uh, what, what that means is not be true to the nasty side of our nature. Obviously, what it means is to be authentically human is to be true to the essential character of the human, which is to be true to our compassion, to be true to the demands of love, to be true to our obligation to be compassionate, kind, respectful towards other people. When we respond to that, when we accept that that's the essential truth about us, we become more authentic. Not mm -hmm. only will we feel better about ourselves, that's, that's a trivial collateral benefit, but mm -hmm. we become far more accessible to other people because they it's as though the, we remove the, the outer shell uh, and people, so often people say, oh, I never really felt I could get to know him. Or, mm -hmm. and, and in a marriage, for example, people will say at mm -hmm. a moment of revelation, well, why didn't you tell me you felt like that? How have you been going on all these years, you pretending that you like this? That? This becomes critical for Richard and Freya. Yes. And yes. they reach that stage. But Absolutely. don't you find it interesting that the, the, phrase, the phrase you quote, to thine own self be true, um, Shakespeare, obviously, when he was uh, doing his uh, uh, recitations and writing down uh, the, this play that he was going to write, yeah. um, had different characters. And he probably came across, he, he authored that uh, phrase and said, oh, this is great. I really must use this. But then he puts it in the mouth of Polonius, mm. not of Hamlet, the yes. tortured self, not of Laertes, the quite transparently uh, decent uh, guy, but in uh, somebody who is a bit of a dis dissembler himself. W why might, you know, w what does that tell us about the, the statement of to that own self be true? Mm. I think it, it tells us an idea. There's a chapter in the book de devoted pretty much to this, but I think it tells us that even when we know that, that, that our personal authenticity depends upon being in touch with our inner life, being in touch with our inner self, we don't always do it. That, mm -hmm. that we are frail and flawed individuals. And in fact, another, just to introduce another metaphor, I think of uh, the, com the capacity for love, compassion mm -hmm. uh, at, our, at our core as being like a kind of inner light. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so the term enlightenment to me means the realization, personal enlightenment, means the realization that this is that I'm I'm born to love. That's why I'm here. Yes. And yes. So if we think of that as the light uh, at at our core, then of course, like all lights, it casts shadows, mm. uh, and many of us uh, find that we feel more comfortable. Sometimes we feel more comfortable in the shadows than in the light, as Polonius certainly did. Yes. There are times yes. when we. Well, Hiding behind the arras. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, that's right. A beautiful metaphor. But there are times when we don't feel like loving someone; we feel like hating them. We don't feel tolerant; we feel consumed by prejudice. We don't feel kind; we feel indifferent. We don't feel respectful; we feel contemptuous. All of that is part of what it means to be human. But I think once we understand that there is this capacity for compassion, for goodness at our very core, then we can perhaps more easily understand where these shadows come from and why we sometimes want to hide in those shadows because the demands of love are quite heavy. We don't always want to be good. We don't always want to be kind. Yeah. Does the, do you think the idea of self changes through our lives? Uh, are we a, a different person uh, later than we were earlier in our lives? Mm. Yes. Uh, absolutely, I do. And in fact, I think it's fair to say that for what we could describe as roughly the first half of our lives, most of us are pretty concerned about the, the external shell, pretty concerned mm -hmm. about the identity, establishing our place on the planet, perhaps choosing a partner, perhaps ha having children, choosing a job, uh, almost adopting a style, a way of dressing, the car we drive, the kind of way we furnish our house, all these external things that say something to other people about who we are. As we mature, and this is often the trigger for the, the classic midlife crisis, 
as we mature, I think we begin to understand there is more to us than that. And so once we go into the inner self, that begins to have an effect also. First of all, on our sense of the importance of the outer shell, we decide the outer shell is much less important than we thought it was. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the way we present to the world begins to change. And I think that's what we describe as maturity and mm. wisdom. You know, wisdom isn't being smarter. Wisdom is perhaps understanding that many aspects of life are mysterious and many questions yeah. don't have answers. Um, and that affects the way we see ourselves and the way we see other people. It's why this, this, this famous U-curve of life, life satisfaction goes down, reaches its deepest point of minimal life satisfaction around our 40s and then mm -hmm. climb so mm -hmm. as long as we don't have financial or health issues as we move into older age it just gets better and better mm -hmm. because this sense of the outer shell falling away and us being more truly who we are now oh, the, the, you say you prefer authenticity to to truth and i think that certainly makes sense in terms of what you're writing about in in, in both books but the, the authenticity is a truthfulness to what we know about ourselves at a point in time. Yes. And in the case of your novel, uh, The Question of Love, there are difficulties in this marriage, even though this couple love each other very much. Um, and the difficulties seem to be not that there's a lack of authenticity between them, because at each time of the, uh, of the novel, they're being as authentic as they think they are yes. Yes. about themselves. Yes. But it's as other things come out, their authenticity awareness changes, if, if, if that's the right way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's a lovely description. I mean, I'd, I'd say, yes, the, 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 it's a series of short chapters, many of them quite repetitive. Oh, uh, that's the way you do the musical variation thing. So yes. Well, well uh, it's like a peeling away of the layers. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's like uh, if we move away from the classical music allusion to jazz, the jazz improvisation, the, 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 the classic jazz musician plays the theme, then goes off into all the improvisations and then replays the theme. And when we hear it the second time, it means much more to us because we've been on the journey of exploration of all the implications and connotations and associations of that theme for that musician. Now, that's what's happening, particularly, I think, to Richard, uh, in the novel, the, the layers are gradually peeling away and we, the reader, I mean, I don't know how you responded, but in writing, Richard, I became more and more sympathetic to him yes. as, as his character became more revealed to me. Mm. Um, and in the end, my heart was bleeding for Richard, whereas in the beginning, he seemed a bit arrogant and a bit aloof and a bit pompous. A bit, bit remote, that's right, yes. Yes, yes. so, um, but the process of us getting that about him uh, as observers in the novel uh, was happening more rapidly than it was happening for him. And of course, eventually Freya, his wife caught up with mm -hmm. this process and she began to sense some of the inner self uh, that was driving uh, Richard in a way that she hadn't in 15 years of marriage. Mm. Now, can I just play a bit further with this idea of authenticity? What is yes. the truth? What is true? Uh, you know, Pontius Pilate says, what is truth? And he, he says it with a sense, he said it with a sense of he really didn't know and he knew it was something so hard to grasp. Um, you could paraphrase that slightly to be what is true. Um, and the thing about trueness, isn't there something to do that trueness is what is a mutually accepted thing between two parties? Um, if, if I say something that I am firmly believe, believe it to be true, from all my experience in life, from all my understanding, it's trueness really in the, in the in the space when I've let it go depends upon whether the person listening can relate to it in the same way. Is, 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 would you agree, would you accept that? Uh, I, I accept that's how it seems, Lynn. But I think there are in the era of fake news, uh, we have to acknowledge that there are many encounters between people who are enthusiastically agreeing about falsehoods. Mm, mm, yes. They are accepting something they've picked up, for example, from social media um, or from QAnon or something. 
yes, uh, yes. and they and they've embraced this as truth as for example as the secret about what donald trump is really up to mm. and then they might talk to someone who shares that view and they're enthusiastic they're embracing each other as though they've both got the truth but we objectively would look at that and say actually what you're agreeing about what you're so convinced about isn't true mm. um so um there is a there is a, a very grim I mean, Pontius Pilate, you know, was touching on a very grey area. Uh, yeah, it yeah, is yeah. it is mo most of what passes for truth is subjective conviction, and that's why when I talk about personal authenticity, I'm talking about getting right to the core, getting away from all the things about our roles and responsibilities and inter interactions might distract us mm. from the truth of, about who we really are, which yes. is not quite the same as saying, when I tell you it's raining, that's true or false. Mm. Yes. Thank you. That, uh, that actually is very helpful. Uh, that does bring together this, uh, this idea of bringing the authenticity back to mm. what uh, is true. I uh, remember reading about a study done, I think, by James Kulinski and others at the University of Illinois on the difference between misinformed and the uninformed, uh, that the, the uninformed, you can present them with true facts yes. uh, and they will become informed. The misinformed, presenting them with true facts, leaves them entrenched even further in yeah. their misinformation. Uh, yes. Anyway, that, 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 that's going yeah. on. So, um, you talked about the, the transparency, you talk about transparency in the, in the inner self and the, and the need to be transparent. That involves issues of trust, doesn't it? Absolutely. Um, and uh, I think one of the reasons why many of us go through large chunks of our life not being transparent and not even being truly authentic is that we fear what other people might think of us if they knew more about us. I think one of the things that inhibits people from undertaking the inner journey of self-discovery and self-reflection is but what if there's something about me that people won't like if they know? Now, uh, and that, so that comes to the question of trust, absolutely. I don't trust, perhaps even a spouse or a partner, I don't trust my partner to continue loving me if I reveal to them what I really think about this or that. There is the further issue of trust, uh, and that is how somebody may use the information they now have about you yes. in a third domain. Yes. Oh, yes. Other, they may misrepresent you. Yes. Um, and can I trust them that if I tell them this, that they yes. will tell this information fairly? Yes, that's right. And that and that phenomenon starts in the school playground, doesn't it, where someone feeling that they've got a close bond with a friend, tell them a secret. Yes. Yeah. Thinking they can trust them with that secret. And then they discover that this has been passed on to a third party and the trust evaporates. Mm. And the person who told the secret is humiliated. And that, that's, that can be a, a long-term scar for people edging towards who can I trust and how authentic should I be. Now, in, in your book, you, you deal with various ways in which uh, people can do that, I, I guess, with a degree of, of safety. But you, you make the point that we actually have to let go of the things that hold us back. Uh, you, you know, you refer to these uh, hiding places. Yes. If we, we can't be transparent with others if, if we're not transparent with ourselves. Mm. Um, That's right. There is, I think, a really important implication of that point, uh, Lynn, which is that coming to terms with the inner self does have relationship implications. I mean, it's, it's really, it's not just something we do so, well, isn't that terrific? Now I know myself better. What it means is we become more accessible to the people who love us. And generally speaking, apart from kids swapping secrets in the playground, as we mature, generally speaking, the people who love us will love us more when, in fact, I, I tell a story in the, in, the, in the book about a man who's reached his 60s and has finally decided he's going to be true to himself. Uh, and his, right. wife, yeah. his, his wife is is astonished at the change that, you know, he's, become, he's dressing differently, he's being a more authentic person, he's relaxing more, and she's saying, you're a lot easier to live with than you used to be. Mm -hmm. And he's pleasantly surprised by the discovery that when he's be being 
truer to himself, he is also actually more attractive to the mm. person who loves him most. But the, the process of being transparent or getting to understand that, I, uh, you, you also tell the story of uh, Georgia and Michael, yes. um, and they, they promise to each other that they will be transparent from the moment they get together. Yes. Uh, it doesn't work out quite as simple as that, uh, and it turns out that even though there was the promise, there isn't the fact. Yes. But isn't there also something that, um, as one goes into a relationship, there is a an opening up, rather uh, in a transition or in a, in a in a movement way, rather than something big bang at the start. Mm. Uh, you know, Richard and Freya do actually have a lot of transparency. They have to develop, and they should have developed it earlier. But is it ever possible to start with that? openness or is that something that has to come with time yes i think it does come with time i think we do we do peel away the layers uh, i quote an american uh, psychiatrist robert berezin uh, who says that love uh, is an encounter between two authentic beings uh, now that's a, a lovely way of putting it because what's implied is if one or other or both of those beings are not authentic, then can it really be love that they're experiencing? Because they might be loving someone other than the actual person. Mm -hmm. But look, it is an unfolding. And I think that's because most of us fall in love, at least for the first time, when we're quite young and when we're obsessed with our external identity and our appearance, our appearance even to the beloved. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do twist ourselves out of shape to some extent, not too much, we hope, but we may pretend <laughs> To enjoy music that we don't really like much in order to appear more attractive than mm. we might otherwise be. We're a bit scared of, uh, of too much exposure of our authentic, uh, mm. too much transparency uh, um, uh, in, in revealing our authentic self. But that's, uh, that is how it is. That's why a lot of relationships founder, of course, that as people mm. over the years do become more authentic to themselves and to the other, it no longer works. They're, they're no longer in tune mm. with each other. More often, as we discover from our marriage statistics, most marriages actually survive in spite of our high divorce rate. Mm. Most, mostly, as we evolve into becoming more authentic, we love each other the same or more because now I know who I'm really loving. Yeah, what, what's and all. What's uh, and all, yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, let's move into this area of love. And uh, you, you, you make a big point of this. You've said in our interview you, uh, tonight that you've also made a big point in the, uh, the, uh, the inner self. And, of course, it's implicit in the question of love. Um, but it isn't just a case of all we need is love, you know, and all yeah. sing happily along in a kumbaya way. Because you do talk about the, uh, the ultimate paradox of selfhood. Um, the, when we get to the core of of who we are, we find that just like everyone else, our essence is love. Um, you, you mention also uh, that it's, it's a pretty universal theme. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the idea that we are at our best, our most human when we are motivated by love is hardly new or revolutionary. Uh, you, you make the point that um, it can be perverted by fundamentalism and bigotry or by institutional corruption. But the central mission of the world's great religions has always been to nurture our capacity for love and to encourage commitment to a life of compassion and service to them. Every non-religious, spiritual or mystical tradition and, the, and most secular philosophy points to the same idea. Mm. I, I mm. quoted earlier about your idea about love, uh, not just as some kind of woolly emotion, but as, uh, as a discipline. Mm. Um, it, it, it obviously is very significant to you. Yes, it is. Uh, and, and I think it's a kind of late-in-life um, insight. Um, I've been a bit slow on the uptake, Lynn. <laughs> I think a lot of people get this at a much younger age than I got it. But it, 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 it strikes me that until we come to this realisation, we can't be authentically ourselves and we can't be authentically available to others either. Uh, as long as we are still trying too hard to create or project an image, the outer self, etc., we are we are concealing ourselves not only from others but from ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, uh, I mean, Gandhi famously said, 
the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Mm. And that is the absolute essence of the paradox that lies at the heart of this book, that we're going to go right inside and discover who we really are and what we're going to come away from that journey knowing mm. is that yeah. we belong to each other. Yes, you quote Grant Gandhi in your book, and I'm just thinking of the, the second greatest commandment in the words of Jesus, to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. I mean, this mm. really brings the two things very, very firmly together. Mm. But uh, is, is there some kind of infinite resource? Uh, you use the metaphor of the solar system, that uh, yes. uh, love is like the, the sun, uh, and, and that we can be revolving around that. Uh, but it, is, is it an infinite resource, or... Is there a finite to us? And I ask this question because of uh, Sigmund Freud, who I know you do not list amongst your, your different quotas of, of what they say about love. Because this is what Sigmund Freud said about loving your neighbor. Yeah. If someone is a stranger to me and he cannot attract me by any worth of his own or any significance that he may already have acquired for my emotional life, it will be hard for me to love him. Indeed, I should be wrong to do so. For well, my love is valued by all my own people as a sign of preferring them. And it is an injustice to them if I put a stranger on a par with them. But if I am to love them with this universal love, merely because he too is an inhabitant of this earth, then I fear that only a small modicum of my love will fall to his share. Now, that's not what I read you say. In, no, uh, and I, uh, there are many, many points at which I disagree profoundly with Sigmund <laughs> Freud. Thought so. And that is one. Um, and of course, he comes out of a very different tradition from the Christian tradition that, that mm, you yes. and I come, up, come out of, uh, where, I mean, the Old Testament injunction to love, love your neighbor meant your neighbor. It didn't mean anyone, as in the Good mm. Samaritan. It meant people like you. Mm -hmm. And that's who you love. Mm. Um, now, Freud, I think, still had some of that in his own thinking. And also, I don't think he really grasped the very point that we're talking about, which is compassion as a discipline, compassion as a way of being in the world, as opposed to some reservoir, limited reservoir of affection that's mm. available to us, and yes. then we've exhausted it, and we haven't got anything left for the bloke who lives at the end of the street. Um, now, I, on the other hand, I do think there is such a thing as compassion exhaustion. I do think there yeah, are times right. when we're just not inclined to be nice people, where we've just had enough of bending over backwards uh, to, to try, not, not to please other people, that's nothing to do with compassion, I'm not in favour of that either, but mm. bending over backwards to be kind and respectful, which is why things like meditation are so important. This is the replenishment of resources. This is why we do need solitude, we do need periods of silence, we do need to curl up with a book on a wet Saturday afternoon. We do need to spend time alone, not mm. just so we'll feel nice, but so we can replenish the resources we need for being truly human. Of course, it is a demanding thing. Mm. And Freud was saying it's so demanding he can't quite bring himself to do it. I'm saying it's so demanding that we can't avoid that demand, even though we will have to we have to husband the resource. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, thank you. That, that, that's very helpful. Um, let's move on to, because you talk about the, the fact that we hide from ourselves. We, uh, we, we, uh, we have various reasons why we become defensive uh, about yes. not wanting to even find out about ourselves, let alone what we may say to others. Yes. And so you have in your book uh, 20 top hiding places, and we haven't got any time to go through all of them. I would like to go through a couple of them. Uh, but to, uh, to, to all, all you who are listening, I encourage you to read the, the very interesting chapters that he has on, uh, on all of them. Um, but the, in these hiding places, let, let's turn to identity. Uh, well, not, it's, it's not uh, the hiding place of identity. It's the hiding place of uh, victimhood. Uh, and this is where you relate the idea of identity. So let me just read. Unless we are irretrievably disadvantaged, being dealt with, this or that hand by uh, by the fates does not entail being defined by the hand we're dealt. That is to say that you're saying that we, we should be able to be resilient and get on top of the circumstances uh, that we face. Um, you, uh, you, you say that 
people who embrace victimhood in any of its guises tend to have an inflated sense of entitlement, more likely to expect others to tolerate their rudeness, insensitivity, or self-centeredness, and are more prone to anger based on a sense of the injustice of it all. Mm. Now, this is really challenging stuff mm. because you, 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 you qualify it with that very important word, unless, because you mm. do acknowledge there are genuinely people uh, and groups in our society who have every cause to feel marginalized. Uh, they've been structurally marginalized, um, and uh, they do have it. But you're, you're going to the general sense that it is a, a, perhaps a default mechanism of many of us who, who, who do not have that excuse to feel a victim. Yes. And um, I've, I've described it as a hiding place, along with all the other hiding places, with the qualification that it's not always a hiding place. I mean, that some people are so irretrievably victimized by yep. their circumstances yep. that they're not hiding in their victimhood. They are actually struggling true. to cope with it. And that applies to busyness or arrogance or nostalgia or any of the other hiding places that I talk about. They're not always hiding places unless we hide in them. Yes, so yes. what I'm concerned about is people who use their circumstances. Look what a terrible life I've had. Look, look how terrible my parents were. Look how unfair it was that I was retrenched when I was 40. Uh, and never recovering from that and using it as a way of hiding from the deeper truth about themselves, which is not they were dealt a, a, a tough hand. Most of us are dealt a tough hand at some time or in some way. Um, but but rising above that in terms of our knowledge of the inner self. In other words, this is what's happened to me, but I'm still one of us. I still have commitment. I mean, one of the things we know, for example, for example about people who are gripped by anxiety, and many people um, present as victims of their anxiety. But one of the things we know about anxiety is the greatest antidote to anxiety is compassion. That if you switch the focus to the needs of other people, your own anxious concerns tend to recede or even vanish in the greater concern for the well-being of someone else that you're attending to. Now, that's the key to escaping from victimhood as a hiding. It's a very unattractive hiding place. Mm -hmm. people, people feel, in the end, quite, quite find it quite hard to feel compassion and sympathy for a person who is perpetually poor me, look look how hard life has been for me. I mean, there's no room for my compassion if you're so if you're wallowing in self pity. But the but the way out of it is to face again the central truth about yourself. I'm not here to feel sorry for myself. I'm here to be a loving person. Who mm -hmm. needs me? Mm. It, 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 uh, to, to, to all of you who are listening, uh, what Hugh does through the various hiding places, he actually puts in uh, stories of people, and, and there's Lucy and her father in the in the in the issue of victimhood. Um, now, just just can we these stories that you put in? Uh, they, they're yes. obviously uh, stories, but they're based upon your experience of people o over years. Is that yes. you right? Yes, all of them. To come back to your concept of truth. Lynn, all of them are true <laughs> uh, in the sense that they, and none of them are a complete case study of a person who's recognizable. I've heavily disguised the people and often I've put together fragments of different cases I've come across into one person. So they've come out of my years of listening to people telling their stories in research. They've come out of people I know, members of my own family, and some of them are actually me in mm -hmm. heavy disguise. Okay. Uh, but that one uh, that you described, Lucy and her father, uh, that's an actual um, um, parent-child yeah. relationship that I'm aware of, where a person who had quite a mild stroke was forever after hmm. prepared to play the victim of uh, the, the yeah. role of stroke victim. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, they, and, th those vignettes of yours give, add to the authenticity of, uh, of, of, of your whole approach, to use, to use that word. But it's it's in this area of talking about identity, uh, and you're saying that uh, these things are not always hiding places but unless we hide from them. So being a victim uh, is only a hiding place if we're, if we're hiding in them, I guess. Mm. Um, but 
identity. Uh, you, you, you make the point that uh, it's all about individual difference. In other words, it relies upon the fact there is somebody else to be different from. Yes. Uh, you know, it's pre-Friday uh, uh, coming along on that uh, desert island, uh, it's a bit hard to imagine Robinson Crusoe having had an identity as such, uh, um, though he would have had it from his previous background. What, what, just talk about your thought of identity, and, and can you morph that into the issue of identity politics? Yes. Yes, I, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a high fashion word. We're all obsessed about identity, so much we're all obsessed about self-esteem, which is closely related to this, feeling good about who you are in the sense of feeling good about the differences between you and everyone else. Well, it's not always desirable to feel good about the differences because some of them are, are, are unattractive. But the problem that I have with our current, the fashionable obsession with identity is that it keeps emphasizing difference as though the deeper layer of who we are, which is our common humanity, is not as important as the differences between us. So I think identity politics is a, is a, a particular expression of this point in our cultural evolution where we've been obsessed with identity. And it's a dangerous development in politics because it's saying, well, forget about the common good, forget about the, the general state of society. We have a case because of our particular identity. Now, I'm all in favour of minorities being fully attended to and their needs being responded to. <laughs> but certainly, I'm not in favour of a political party, for example, that exists only to serve the identity of a particular subgroup mm. uh, or a political philosophy that is based on my identity, which is all about how I'm different from you, whereas the body politic, the health of the body politic depends ultimately mm. on us realising there is such a thing as the common good and there is such a thing as common humanity. Isn't there something yeah. here about the, a, a distortion of the, of the concept of uh, identity? Because you're talking in the book about one's identity, one's own identity, and yes. that this is a relational thing. But sometimes identity politics moves beyond the, the I, and you used the pronoun yourself just a moment ago, we, yes. um, where it becomes genericized. And so in a sense, it's almost a contradiction of the, the concept of identity that you're talking about in the book. Yes. Yes, it's true. It's people who say, well, our, our outer shell uh, mm. shells have enough in common for us to say, yes, we are, we are a persecuted minority or we are a distinct group that needs to get special attention and so on. Yes, there is a kind of a contradiction because identity is ultimately the triumph of the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's just, I just want to go off on a bit of a tangent here because you talk about the dark side uh, mm -hmm. and so, you know, Trekkies and so on, think of Darth Vader and, uh, and, all, and come over to the dark side. Um, I, I'm more taken with the uh, recent biography of Richard Nixon. Uh, the biographer, uh, when interviewed uh, on radio, I heard him describe Nixon as his own Iago. Um, and uh, I, I just thought that was a, yes. a very powerful way of describing the fact that we all have our own Iago yes. within us. Uh, yes. Just talk a bit about the, the, this yes. idea of the dark side. Yes, I think one of the things that inhibits people from exploring the inner self is the fear that they will uncover the dark side. Now, um, uh, Carl Jung, of course, is famous for talking about the shadow that we all live with, which is his poetic way of describing mm -hmm. the dark side. Um, now, we have a dark side because we are animated ultimately by the light of our loving nature which cast shadows. Now, there are people who prefer the shadows, um, but, but only a fool would say there are no shadows. And I think that's true. We, we, we have to acknowledge that we all have a dark side. We have to acknowledge that there is a struggle between good and evil in us, to put it in really primitive terms. But where does that struggle come from? And where does that dark side come from? Now, I... I, I a very strong believer in the fact that we can come more easily to terms with our dark side when we recognize that it is a shadow cast by our essential goodness, by our essential compassionate nature. That's why we experience jealousy, anger, hate, 
That's why we're pursued by ambition. That's why we uh, all for victimhood or you know, whatever, uh, whatever dark aspect of us we have to come to terms with. It's there because we are loving beings and that cast shadows. So we don't have to deny them. On the other hand, I don't think we have to, em well, I suppose we have to embrace them as part of us, but we have to acknowledge that they're only there because there's a light. Mm. I, and, and I, I certainly can very easily uh, come live with that. One of the things that the, I, as a, uh, as a, as a priest, um, really think, have thought about it a fair bit is that we are who we are, which is the sum total of all who we are, including the, the dark places we discover within us yes. and how we become, how we try to work with those. So that if, uh, when that moment comes, when we finish the race uh, and we've arrived in eternity, um, what will it be that arrives in eternity? Um, will it be this complex being that had to go through the pilgrimage of life, the struggle of life, the, the dealing with the dark sides of our lives, so that it is a very nuanced, I think almost a richer kind of personality than, than somebody who never, who, 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 who thinks it might just be that we become just the pure out of all that. Oh, yes. I, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, people in trouble say that they, whether, whether the trouble is some kind of trouble they've got themselves into through misbehavior, misdemeanors of some kind, or whether it's a major health issue or something else, that the people who are most helpful to them are those who've also been through it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the visitation from a saintly figure who's never had to deal with hardship or darkness or despair, uh, loss, disappointment, failure, etc. Not much use at all. It sounds very pious and remote. Mm, yeah. uh, we need, we need, when we're down in the mud, needing help to get out, we need the help. The, the, the best help will come from people who've been in the mud. Mm. Well, you talked about piety. So maybe we'll move on to another one of your hiding places, uh, possible hiding places, and that is religion and science. Mm. Uh, you put them both together in a very intriguing chapter. Um, and I'll just read out a couple of elements, a couple of pieces justifying appalling behavior in the name of god or in the name of science is one way of hiding from the truth about the dark side of our nature a more common misuse of religion and science is as a distraction from the engagement with the inner life now and in fact further down you you talk about uh, liturgy is one of the best places to hide from god now you do qualify that because the, the point you make before is it's uh, a place is only a hiding place if we're choosing them to be a hiding place mm -hmm. Mm. Liturgy can be a, a, a grand opening up of the religious experience, mm. or it can be something we hide behind. Yes. Um, but you, 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 you grab together religion and science in the one bag, which is mm. not often what uh, people do. No, no. And, and a lot of people who are science worshippers will object strenuously uh, to being bracketed with God worshippers, um, uh, and perhaps vice versa. But I think they do belong together in the way that the, 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 the quote that you read, Lynn, captures part of what I'm saying here. It's partly that our worst examples of the dark side, the worst examples of human uh, cruelty uh, come from uh, people who say they are doing this in the name of God or in the name of science. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and also, these things can distract us um, but from the need to go inside and mm. to come to terms with who we really are. So the ritual, like the liturgy, uh, can become such a comfortable place to be that it allows me to just go through the motions week after week without ever going inside and seeing mm -hmm. what this really means. There's a lovely, uh, Marcus Borg has a, a quote, so I think a Buddhist uh, saying that uh, a, 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 a wise man points to the moon yes, and yes. a fool looks only at the finger. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that captures what I'm saying here that we can get preoccupied with kind of the mechanics, the, the artifacts, 
uh, or in the case of science, we can get so caught up in the excitement of the discovery of a black hole or some, some other thing that science is doing, which can be wonderful as, I mean, both science and religion take us to the very frontiers mm -hmm. of human thought and human possibility, but they both run the risk for us of thinking that this is all so wonderful that we, we forget mm. about the essence of who we really are uh, yes, you, you, and you, you, how that essence can be enriched mm. by our engagement with science or religion. You, you do talk about this idea of the artifact worship and the, uh, Marcus Borg, who you quote, is from his book in reading the Bible again for the first time. Yes. Um, but you're also talking about the fact that you make a, a statement higher up the danger of assuming that science is morally neutral and that every scientific frontier is worth exploring, to which you're also, I think, saying the mirror image of that from religion is the danger of assuming that religion is morally superior and that every uh, uh, religious idea is, is, is worth uh, promoting or something. I'm just yes. paraphrasing yes. that. Yes, no, that's, that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, we can see that, uh, and I don't want to offend any members of our audience this evening, but... We can see that in the extremes of religion, particularly um, um, rabbit fundamentalism, where all kinds of artifacts, all kinds of aspects uh, of religious doctrine or ritual or practice become so important that the essence of what it's all about, namely encouraging us to live a compassionate life, to be loving to our neighbors, etc., is lost. Uh, in in the struggle to argue over a particular piece of scripture, whether it means this or that, and so on. In, in fact, worship of scripture itself as an artifact uh, can be a huge distraction <laughs> from the truths embedded in it. And the same thing happens uh, with science, uh, where, where the, the so-called scientism, uh, which is where where people become so preoccupied with the the idea that science is going to unlock the mysteries of the universe and therefore the key to the meaning of life is an absurd idea. Yeah. <laughs> you, you refer in, in, uh, in the chapter to what was happening in the French Revolution, that they were converting churches into temples of reason. Yes. And, uh, Louis Mercier, who I mentioned a moment ago, in his futurist novel, he, he has that. He's, he's uh, maintained those temples of reason right through to the year 2500 according to his speculations. Right. Um, now, we're, 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 we're coming to the end of our time together, which is unfortunate because there is so much in both your books um, to be dealt with. Um, you finish off the inner uh, life with an appendix. Um, and uh, it, we can only learn to love by loving. And what you have there are what, not the Ten Commandments, uh, which are commandments, you have eight perhapses. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that each one is a perhaps yes. rather than thou shalt not or <laughs> thou shalt. Uh, yes. Just tell us a bit about your perhapses. Yes, yes, yes. What I'm, what I'm saying is when we come to a realization of who we really are, when we come to an understanding of the fact that we share a common humanity and that we are by nature lo loving, compassionate creatures, this might perhaps mean that we are inclined to manage an intimate relationship uh, more kindly, more tolerantly than before. Or it might perhaps mean that we are going to be more outspoken in arguments with people about our convictions, but at the same time more respectful of other people's point of view. In other words, what I'm saying here is we can go on absolutely living the life we live and having the convictions that we have and maintaining the relationships that we already have, but perhaps managing all of that a little bit differently in the light of the insight that our job in the world as a member of this species is to handle it all kindly and respectfully uh, not not to abandon all those things that we find difficult, but to manage them differently. I, I hope I'm not stretching a bow too far, but I, I the symbolism of the word perhaps struck me. Mm. And I, th I for me, it seemed to bring together that you found a way of addressing this ultimate paradox of selfhood that you've spoken about. Uh, that here we have, find your inner self, but you only ever find your inner self if you find it 
in community mm. and the synapse as we talked before uh, between these two becomes love mm. uh, the ten commandments um, were these commandments as they are are shalt not or shalt you shall do these things there is not a there is not an alternative here yes the perhaps yes. is is recognizing identity self selfness that you have to make your own choices yes uh, about these things yes very much so uh, and that's the spirit of the book that that we will each discover this truth about ourselves and it will be manifested differently because of our different identities because of our different capacities different personalities different formative experiences and so on uh, i'm the opposite of prescriptive about what should happen except only to be prescriptive <laughs> in in saying we, we haven't got to the essence of ourselves until we've discovered what our common humanity means, but then how we express it. There'll be lots of different ways of doing that, perhaps this, perhaps that. I'm, I'm the opposite of prescriptive when it comes to how we'll implement the insight. And your whole issue here is that there is this, you've used the word inter interdependence a few times, that there is an interactivity element involved uh, here. Uh, so perhaps I can just quote uh, from uh, Freya herself uh, in your book. Oh, yes. she's, she's be, both of them have been through an interesting kind of journey, a journey they would, would not have predicted and uh, are surprised when it happens. And she, she come, this is the point she's coming to. Would I ever leave Richard? I know he fears that very thing, and I wish I could find the words to convince him that it will never happen. This is a strange kind of love we have, but maybe no stranger than any kind of love. Sometimes I think the gaps between us are like unbridgeable chasms. Sometimes I think they're mere fissures. I fear I could become a very unpleasant person if I didn't have Richard in my life. Yes, yes. And, and to me that, that sums up what you're I think you're trying to say is that uh, there is this this duality uh, of the of, of love. It, it too sits out there between us and anyone else. Yes, yes, and casts its shadow. So, uh, as Freya reflects, there are times when she feels their differences are unbridgeable, and other times when she's feeling more in tune with her inner self, when she realizes that that the, the love they have for each other means that that marriage will endure. As I'm left the book feeling convinced it would endure mm -hmm. um, because they're edging closer and closer to an understanding of who they really are. But it is, uh, it's interesting you read that piece that does capture a recurring theme in that novel and, and in the inner self, that there are times when we want to be loving. There are times when we want to tell a partner or a friend what they really mean to us, but we're inhibited. We, we feel, uh, don't, I mean, Richard himself says, how much Freya means to him, but he can never actually say it to her. Uh, and that's a tragedy, of course, because that, that means uh, I am experiencing love, compassion, kindness, gratitude, all of those things to this person, yet I haven't quite got to the point where I understand that I feel all those things because of the connection between us. And, the, and, it's, and it's kind of, well, it's sad, Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also a bit silly not to be able to make that explicit. Most of us do like to hear uh, the words that explain the nature of this connection. The words that explain this connection. Well, you've done, you've written words that explain that. It is always a pleasure to talk with you. I enjoy our conversations there. You're always very stimulating. And thank you for these two books that you have written. I encourage them to be... Uh, to, to uh, readers, uh, listeners, to, to buy them and uh, read and be stimulated by the uh, very thought-provoking words of Hugh McKay. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank you very much indeed, and I appreciate that.